Thank you, Wes. My name is Bob Kraft. I'm chairman of the International Law Committee of the United Nations Association and the National Capital Area Chapter, the largest chapter of the UNA. And our International Law Committee is really honored today to be sponsoring this program on Law of the Sea and to have such a distinguished panel. We have with us uh, one of the world's leading experts on Law of the Sea, Professor John Norton Moore, who has been an expert on Law of the Sea for as long as I can remember. Um, Ruth Wedgwood, Myron Nordquist, and Doug Burnett, and I will give you uh, just a very brief biography of each of them. Uh, but those here are in, who are in the room will ha have a complete biography, and we will put that online. This is being live streamed, and it will also be available subsequently on both the UNA website and on ASIL's website. I'd like to thank Wes Rist and ASIL for hosting us here at Tiller House um, and for the arrangements they made, and to thank also the International Law Committee of the ABA that has promoted this event. Uh, John Norton Moore, as probably everybody listening knows, is the Walter L. Brown Professor of Law at the University of Virginia School of Law and a former U.S. Ambassador to the Law of the Sea negotiations. He, I was about to say he's the author of a number of books and articles until I looked it up and saw that that number is 35 books and 170 articles. Um, Ruth Wedgwood is the Burling Professor of International Law at Johns Hopkins Sice, the former Charles Stockton Professor at the U.S. Naval War College, former mem member of the Pentagon Defense Policy Board, a member of the State Department Advisory Committee on Public International Law, on the Board of Advisor Advisors of the Lieber Institute at West Point, and on the Board of Advisors of the U.S. Naval War College uh, for International Studies. Douglas Barnett is the Maritime Partner at Squire, Patton, and Boggs, co-editor and co-author of Submarine Cables, the Handbook on Law and Policy, and co-author of the International Submarine Cables and Biodiversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. Marlon Norquist, also been involved in the Law of the Sea for as long as I can remember, is the Associate Director and Editor of the Center for Oceans, Law, and Policy, and a Senior Fellow for the Center for National Security Law at the University of Virginia Law School. And it's now my distinct honor and personal pleasure to turn this over to John Norton Moore. Bob, thank you very much, and thank uh, the American Society of International Law and the UN Association for sponsoring uh, this uh, discussion today. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is one of the most important multilateral treaties in world history. It was also one of the greatest negotiating successes for the United States of America. And it is critically important for United States security, energy, trade, and jobs. Yet inexplicably, the United States, which was certainly one of the most important players in the actual negotiation, is still not a party. Though the treaty is in force for 167 countries today and the European Union, to date, United States adherence has been blocked by an ideologically driven minority in the United States Senate. As we begin a new Republican administration, however, we should keep in mind that the treaty remains low-hanging fruit for any administration that seeks to move forward effectively uh, and to have United States uh, adherence. And there is an interesting parallel here with uh, President Ronald Reagan. President Ronald Reagan moved forward the Genocide Convention despite the fact that it, it had been blocked in the Senate for many years by a small ideologically driven minority in the Senate. 
Now, in setting the stage for the panel today, I'm going to uh, give you really sort of a series of bullets in three different areas. First, I want to talk a little bit about what does the convention do for the United States. Secondly, I want to talk a little bit about the cost to date of United States non-accession uh, for our country. And the third is I want to give you a list, an extraordinary list of the national support for the Law of the Sea Convention and moving it through the Senate. Now let's start with a fairly brief list of direct benefits for the United States of this convention as it was negotiated, again, significantly with U.S. negotiating involvement. We have a fourfold extension of the United States territorial sea from the previous three nautical miles to 12 nautical miles off our coast. We have a doubling of the United States contiguous zone from 12 nautical miles to 24 nautical miles. We have an eightfold extension of United States jurisdiction over archeological and historical objects found at sea from three nautical miles to 24 nautical miles. We have a massive extension of national sovereign rights over oil and gas, fish stocks and other activities for economic exploitation of the seas to 200 nautical miles off the coast of the United States and our Pacific Island possessions. We have an extension of national sovereign rights over the oil and gas of the continental shelf from a narrow geologic continental shelf, which we had before the negotiations, throughout the much broader 200 nautical mile economic zone and beyond, approximately to the entire geologic continental margin and extending off Alaska as far as 600 nautical miles from our coast. We have a clarified and enhanced regime of innocent passage for transit through the territorial sea, meeting United States objectives as sought. We have a new regime of straits transit rights, permitting overflight and submerged transit in straits used for international navigation as sought as a critical issue by the United States Navy for our aircraft and our strategic SSBN submarines. We had assured access to strategic minerals from the deep seabed of copper, nickel, cobalt, manganese, and rare earths from rich mine sites in the mid Pacific, holding an aggregate value of these strategic minerals worth more than 1 trillion. Each mine site is approximately the size of the state of Rhode Island. An important precedent for U.S. participation in international institutions in awarding the United States the only permanent seat on the Council of the International Seabed Authority, a small functional agency which will enable property rights in deep seabed mine sites beyond the national jurisdiction of any nation. We have critical protection for transoceanic cables carrying the bulk of international communication, including the bulk of global internet traffic. And we have one of the world's great experts today to talk about that uh, and its importance for the internet, Douglas Burnett. And we have a powerful dispute settlement provision for enforcing convention provisions for prompt release of vessels and crews seized by another nation. Now that's the good news. Let's turn to the bad news. Non-accession is imposing substantial and continuing costs on the United States. These include the recent loss to Belgium of one of the four original United States deep sea bed mine sites, USA-3, holding strategic minerals of an estimated aggregate value of over 250 billion. And following that, the recent loss to the United Kingdom of a second of these mine sites that were the United States, 
Again, the size of the state of Rhode Island with an aggregate value of 250 billion in the mineral resources in that area. And make no mistake, these were negotiated as United States mine sites. They were called USA 1, USA 2, USA 3, and USA 4. Substantial risk of loss, if not certainty of loss, of the remaining two United States deep seabed mine sites still held by Lockheed with an estimated aggregate value of over 500 billion in strategic minerals. If the U.S. does not adhere to the convention, other nations will simply be awarded the licenses to these sites as we have already lost half of the deep sea bed sites, which by the way, were a critical issue for President Ronald Reagan. Hobbling, if not killing, the United States flag deep sea bed mining industry, initially the best in the world, as a result of this enormous delay. Removing the United States from the ability to shape the rules for deep sea bed mining that have now largely gone forward without us and without our participation. Removing the United States from the ability to shape the rules for finalizing the outer edge of the continental margin. And now it has moved us way down a list of nations to get our margin approved by the international authority uh, that uh, basically passes on the margins. Uh, those rules can be of great importance for the size of the shelf. Placing at risk international recognition of the extended continental shelf of the United States an area which may well be larger than the Louisiana Territory acquired for the United States by President Jefferson. Placing at risk the hard-won navigational provisions so essential for United States naval mobility. Our non-party status severely inhibits the U.S. in multiple ways in ensuring the continuation of these convention victories. Removing the United States from the convention processes for blocking undesirable amendments to the convention. Ensuring second class status for the United States and influencing the future direction of ocean's law. As a non-party to the convention, the United States is relegated to an observer role along with that of non-governmental organizations in the annual meeting of state parties a core Oceans Law Forum at the United Nations. And as a non-party, the United States has no seat in the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf and no judge on the Law of the Sea Tribunal. And finally, undermining the negotiating effectiveness of the United States in future international negotiations by failing to adhere to the Convention after the international community renegotiated part 11 of the Convention on Seabed Mining to meet each and every one of the conditions set by President Ronald Reagan for United States participation. Now let me just give you to in this get a sense of the strength of the support for the Convention in the United States. Um, though I have not uh, yet heard the views of the Trump presidency, um, they uh, presumably have a full agenda of other items they're addressing at this point, and we'll get to it in due course, as other presidents have. But prior to that, all American presidents of both parties, since the successful renegotiation of Part 11, um, have supported U.S. Uh, adherence. Our nation's national security team, including all successive chairmen of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, as well as all commandants of the Coast Guard and Secretaries of Homeland Security. As Michael Chertoff, President George W. Bush's Secretary of Homeland Security, put it in a letter, quote, the entire civilian and military leadership responsible for our nation's security, from the President and his National Security Advisor on down, unanimously support the convention without reservation. All Secretaries of State, all directors of national intelligence, all assistants to the president for national security affairs, unanimous support of the bipartisan National Commission 
on oceans policy created jointly by the executive branch and the Congress. The National Governors Association, in a bipartisan letter signed by then Governor Sarah Palin and Governor Martin O'Malley, the United States Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, the Financial Roundtable, the American Petroleum Institute, the National Ocean Industries Association, the Chamber of Shipping of America, the Chemical Manufacturers Association, the Outer Continental Shelf Policy Committee, and United States Oil, Gas, Mining, Shipping, and Undersea Cable Companies. For me, I believe the, uh, the best short statement about this was made in recent testimony supporting the uh, U.S. adherence by the then Commandant of the United States Coast Guard, who testified to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, quote, it's almost like having a winning lottery ticket that you don't cash in, end quote. <laughs> Let me turn at this point to Myron Nordquist. <clears throat> Thank you, John. I was expecting to be the second speaker, but if you want me to be the first speaker, I'll do my best. I have the same assignment regardless. That is uh, to pick up two important issues. One is first to mention that the grand compromise at the Law of the Sea Convention uh, conference and in the convention was to find a 200 mile EEZ and uh, then ensure that there was freedom of navigation in that EEZ. That was the deal that was really made. And of course, it covers about half the Earth's surface. So as we all know from the figures that Professor Moore just cited, the, uh, the, the amounts of area here are rather mind boggling. My two issues then are going to be the extended continental shelf. Can we see if we can get my picture? Uh, yeah, I don't know. These are, these were not, I didn't set it up. See, John. He, he uh, so, okay, okay, let's actually, I'm sorry. I, yes, I did tell Doug that he would go first. Uh, my apologies, Myron. Doug, your slides are up. Let's go ahead with you. <laughs> but, <laughs> Myron, you get extra time. I woke up. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would just like to uh, thank everyone for uh, attending and for those that are um, assisting or uh, viewing this presentation um, um, versus uh, uh, in remote sites on the webinar. You can be sure that you're seeing it thanks to a fiber optic cable. And just so people can understand that, I've got a piece of fiber optic cable. Uh, this is the kind that we would use in the high seas. The business end are these fiberglass light sides. I'll give it to the panel, and then if you just pass it to the audience. It's like a hypodermic needle. But yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> uh, but that's the, uh, the force of the internet. So I think the question, I'm going to break up my talk into three parts. Five minutes, a little bit of call Cable 101, a little background. Uh, they're going to look at a couple of contemporary problems uh, that I think show some of the, the difficulties that uh, U.S. Uh, companies uh, have in dealing with the world without uh, the U.S. being a party. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, the current uh, efforts to uh, come up with a possible implementing a convention to the um, uh, UNCLOS dealing with biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And before I go, I just want to say that the remarks today are those of my own. They do not represent the International Cable Protection Committee or any of its members. So we're looking here at a, a, a design. The light shows the amount of internet activity, I'm told. And so this is what we're, we're talking about when we talk about what submarine cables and the internet are, are bringing to us. So well, maybe a, it isn't the cable. <laughs> um, OK, here we go. What's driving the demand, of course, is, is the surge of the internet. Uh, these figures show in, in 2020, we're looking at about 4 billion people connected. We're looking at about 54 trillion in revenue opportunities, uh, over 25 million applications. Um, 
we'll have about over 25 billion embedded systems, uh, 50 trillion gigabits of data. Uh, you hear the phrase, the Internet of Things, this thing's talking to each other, whether it's automated cars, whether it's your washing machine at home. Right now we have about 30 million uh, of these, uh, 30 billion of these connections out of a potential of uh, 212 billion connections. And, um, you know, this is 28 times the population of the, uh, the Earth. So this is what's driving the internet, and this is what's driving the innovation that we see in uh, submarine cables. Um, <clears throat> one example, um, just pick three companies off their internet sites, uh, Google, uh, Microsoft, and Amazon. When they talk about the cloud, what they're really talking about are server farms located strategically around the world. And all of these uh, server farms are connected by submarine fiber optic cables. And in fact, in the last 10 years, we've seen uh, into the uh, submarine cable uh, ownership and, and construction uh, heavy entries by Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and Amazon. And so that's a transformation. The legacy telecom companies are somewhat receding uh, as their greatest users have decided that the submarine cables are things that they need to have access to. So that's a, a transformative thing uh, that is going on. Um, you know, it's, this is a diagram showing where the cables are going. Um, as you can see, they're connecting everything. I mean, the last big continent to be connected uh, was about five years ago was Africa. And now we've got about six different cables going around Africa. So basically the world is, is being connected and is connected uh, through these cables. Um, and there's a couple of quotes. I mean, one from the, uh, the Law of the Sea report of the Secretary General that they now recognize that um, uh, this submarine cables are critical international infrastructure. They're critical for uh, sustainable development of, of any country. And uh, I always like the quote from Stephen Malfus, who was the um, uh, Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, saying if, if the cables networks go down, you know, the financial set does not grind to a halt, it snaps to a halt. And of course, he's referring to the fact that any dollar transaction in the world has to pass through New York, and they pass through it on fiber optic uh, cables. So cable by numbers, over 98% of international internet, voice, data, telephone traffic is all carried on the cables. It's about 248 or 41 international systems, about a million kilometers in length. Uh, the cables are owned by companies, usually consortiums, because of the, the cost. They have anywhere from four to 30 companies. There are some cables that are owned by one company, but generally they get together and will put together a, a cable consortium. Have about 59 cable ships in the world. About half are on standby, ready to sail on 24 hours notice uh, to carry out emergency repairs, and the other half are busy laying uh, new cable systems. And they organize 10 regional agreements by contract, so repairs are carried out not by government mandate, but by contract, which always comes somewhat of a surprise to many of the governments. Um, but that's how that works. The goal is uh, 24 hours to try to have the ship sail to carry out the uh, repairs. And uh, generally, there's a tremendous amount of uh, peer review literature showing that the submarine cables have a, a benign impact on the uh, ocean. Um, so. That's it. So there's background on the cables. Um, just give you one example that uh, uh, I was involved in. Uh, this was a case study, I think, with Malta. There was a cable system called the European India Gateway System. Starts in the UK, uh, went to Spain, Gibraltar, uh, went to Libya, uh, across the Mediterranean, uh, through the, um, the Red Sea, uh, all the way to India. And in particular, uh, you'll find that inter to the success of the submarine cable business has been the provisions in the law of the sea. There's 10 articles that deal with submarine cables in all of the uh, zones of the, uh, of the law of the sea. And the freedom to lay and maintain cables is critical and has been since cables first uh, entered the ocean in 1850. But this particular cable, uh, the EIG, as you can see, it's got a green line here. Um, here it is coming down from uh, across the Mediterranean, from Gibraltar in England, 
Here's the Libya leg, and then it goes on down over to uh, Egypt. But it never entered Malta's territorial mm -hmm. sea or its contiguous zone, but it did pass through what Malta claims as its continental shelf. And Malta had enacted a domestic law saying that if you pass through or across our continental shelf, then you're required to pay for that uh, opportunity because actually this is, in Malta's view, a seabed resource. And that was going to be around, um, I think, uh, two and a half million euros a year. But the companies realized if you've ever been to the Mediterranean, the whole Mediterranean is somebody's continental shelf. You'd never be able to build the cables if you had to pay a toll every time you went across somebody's uh, uh, continental shelf boundary claim, let alone if it was a disputed claim. So they decided uh, that they would not um, pay that amount. And there was a, a letter from the uh, Malta government that sort of insinuated that there would be consequences, that the cable ships might have uh, some, some visits. Um, and so the question what to do. Uh, under the law of the Sea Convention, of course, private companies have no rights. It's only the states. Uh, the American telecommunication companies were quite concerned about this, but it was recognized early on because the United States is not a party to UNCLOS, there really was no effective remedy. And from prior experiences, when you try to have the U.S. government uh, advocate on your behalf for uh, what should be a right under UNCLOS, the other countries usually dismiss it saying, when you're a party, then we'll talk about it. So in this particular case, they uh, approached the British government, the UK Foreign Commonwealth Office, who then uh, began the dialogue with Malta, uh, ultimately filed some sort of a, of a protest, uh, later joined by France and later joined by Poland. Uh, they took it to a European Union forum called Comar, which is where the states that have uh, sea frontiers deal with maritime law of the sea boundaries. Uh, don't know exactly what happened, but the long and the short is that um, there's no issue now with Malta. I think they've agreed that it's the status quo and, and to leave it. But once again, if you are an American company, you would like to be able to have the State Department advocate for your rights uh, or, or the benefits that you have, but you cannot do it when you're not a party. So. In this particular case, uh, the UK and France were able to uh, step in because they had some nationals involved on their behalf. But you may have situations where American interests are at stake, but the State Department will have their arm tied behind its back because you are not a party. So there's, you know, I think an example there, a very concrete one. Um, what I'm showing here, uh, these are the statistics for repairs to international cables. Cables are very reliable, but you do have issues where cables are broken, usually by bottom trawl fishing or anchors, occasionally by underwater earthquakes or landslides. And this just shows the statistically where the, um, the issues are. And you can see some of them are in territorial waters, which are the yellow. Uh, some are uh, green economic zone. The blue are the high seas, so you can see in the entire world in the high seas, there's only about four repairs a year. Uh, very deep water, there's no man-made activities down there, so that's what you have. But what you see, I'll try to explain, if you know China has probably the most um, faults, um, and it's because it has a very, a very aggressive um, fishing industry. And they have a, a good domestic law, but it's never enforced against the fishing because uh, under UNCLOS, you're supposed to have a law that makes the willful or the negligent destruction of submarine cables a, a, a national criminal uh, offense. But as the fish get fished out closer to China, they move farther off to sea, and now they're going into what is claimed by Japan. So for the first time, we're seeing spike in Japan in their economic zone from Chinese fishing vessels that are active in those waters. And the problem was they don't bury the cables that far out to sea normally because there's no trawling. But as the trawling gets deeper, now you have cables exposed. So th the point is that, you know, you, you do need to um, uh, be able to advocate. And in the case of China, I know at, at one point they did make a had a special appointment with the Chinese, uh, both the ambassador and also in Beijing, and to talk about the problem of, of repairs being delayed for permits and the number of incidents, which affects everybody's communications, 
And I was told that, you know, it's, the conversation was, well, when the United States becomes a party, the Law of the Sea Convention, then we can talk about it. So what's next on your agenda? And that was the end of it. So it does have an impact um, when it comes to um, uh, the ability of U.S. companies to uh, function in an international ocean environment. Um, currently, what we've got is in the um, United Nations, there is a preparatory commission started in 2015 and it continues this year to see if there is a consensus for developing a new binding international legal instrument uh, to preserve biodiversity beyond um, uh, national waters. And this would be seen as an implementing agreement under uh, UNCLOS. And once again, here the issue is that a lot of national interests are trying to, um, in our view, undercut freedom of the sea, um, freedom to lay cables, freedom of navigation, uh, other issues. Um, and, you know, it's a very contentious area. But you've seen a lot of changes. When the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated, and I just, by well, my research, but I'm sure Myron and um, uh, the ambassador would be able to confirm it, key players on those Law of the Sea uh, provisions for freedom of the seas were the United States, the United Kingdom, uh, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, that's changed. Um, you don't see the United Kingdom involved anymore, at least publicly, uh, they may be behind the seas, uh, behind the scenes. Um, you're seeing some countries that are trying to work for the Freedom Lake Cable, Singapore, Indonesia, now Japan, but you have the European Union very strongly uh, in once a total regulatory regime over the high seas for navigation, for cables, uh, a lot of things. So very contentious issues. The U.S. has an excellent diplomat uh, that handles the negotiations, but as you read sort of the transcript of the uh, events that's made public, you can see they're under a lot of uh, disadvantage because everyone knows the U.S. isn't a party to the Law of the Sea Convention, so they're probably not going to be a party to this one. So they're at a diminished uh, ability, I think, to negotiate. Uh, they're being very tactful and very good in terms of their diplomacy, but it's just clear there's a disadvantage when you are not a uh, party to the um, uh, the Law of the Sea Convention. So I think just wanted to put that information out to the uh, uh, the group to to consider. Thank Doug, you. thank you yep. very much. Uh, let's turn to uh, Myron at this point. I'm going to look. As I started to say, it, there there was a grand compromise at the con at the Law of the Sea conference, and the majority of the developing countries in the world wanted to have a 200-mile exclusive economic zone, and uh, the major maritime powers certainly wanted to have freedom of navigation in that 200-mile area. The U.S. got both we have the largest 200 mile zone in the world and we have potential for more, which is what I'm about to talk about. Uh, and we were the major and remain the major beneficiary of the very good provisions, better provisions than we could get again uh, on freedom of navigation, which includes submarine cables and pipeline. It was all a run-on sentence, freedom of navigation and, and uh, the laying and maintenance of submarine cables and pipelines. Uh, so uh, I concur with many of things that Doug said, although he knows a lot more about many things than I. The first slide here has kind of two things of interest. Uh, one is that you see how big the 200 mile zone is. To, to give you some idea, if you have a little dot in the ocean like Johnston Island and you arc a 200 miles zone around it, that resource area is larger than the state of California. And we got a bunch of islands. You'll also note the biggest yellow one up there is the extended continental shelf. In other words, we know, we know everybody has 
200 miles of continental shelf if they aren't into somebody else's uh, jurisdiction. And uh, there's an area left which has not yet been grabbed. And, uh, and in the article, nine, one, on article 76, you have the outer limit of the continental shelf uh, set. And they, part, one of the institutions that was uh, set up in the, in the uh, convention was a commission on the limits of the continental shelf. So the way you get beyond 200 miles, uh, although under the convention, it's an inherent uh, right uh, because it's part of the natural prolongation of the land territory. But the way you get it holy watered is that you go to a commission on the limits of the continental shelf. But of course you have to be a party in order to go to the limits of the continental shelf. And bankers, as nice as they are, they are risk adverse. And unless you have a commission recommendation, which your government has accepted, they are not going to give you the money to go out on the extended continental shelf. And, and you can see just by the yellow there, uh, it, it's in the Arctic that there is the most for the United States don't mind, we'll try the next, mm -hmm. to, to gain. These are the Arctic states and who has what claim to the extended continental shelf there on this. And uh, you'll notice that I, I kind of use the Arctic Circle as the place to begin, but in any event, uh, the uh, United States has a, has a great potential, uh, mainly in the Turkey Sea borderlands, uh, for extending beyond 200 nautical miles. And believe it or not, at some point, there must have been jungle all over the Arctic because that's the way you get sedentary deposits from which you get oil and gas. So there, the, the biggest thing you ought to take away from this slide is that look who the, the uh, big gorilla is up there. It's Russia. They have over seven, well, probably over 70% of the places that might really be good for oil and gas. But even on that, you can see, because they have more continental shelf, but you can, you can see they're at least half. Uh, so we, uh, we sometimes have these meetings where uh, they talk all about the Arctic, but there isn't anybody from Russia there. And that's a big mistake because they are the, uh, country that they, they, I think, now have 40 Arctic uh, nuclear powered uh, icebreakers. America has two, and none, neither is nuclear powered. In fact, they're, they're old and decrepit. So their, their leader has said their future is in the Arctic. You can see here why. So the next one. So that, that was the first thing I want to talk about, the EEZ and the Arctic Extended Continental Shelf. The second uh, main focus uh, is the importance of uh, commercial and military navigation. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm going to concentrate mostly on the Malacca. There are 116 of these straits around the world. Uh, Malacca has more than half of the world's uh, annual merchant fleet tonnage that goes through it, uh, and a third of all the maritime traffic worldwide. Uh, the Strait of Malacca in particular connects one of the most important shipping lanes in the world uh, because it links the Indian and Pacific Oceans. And uh, of course, as soon as you start talking about Malacca, you are almost right in the middle of the South China Sea. Now, one of the problems I'll mention before I talk about the South China Sea is that Malaysia has come out and said that they expect these nuclear powered ships to get permission to go through their EEZ. They've also said that they, um, 
they want uh, notification for any military ships that go through. The deal that was made and the reason that they have something called a straits provision is because there was a quid pro quo that if we could continue to have freedom of navigation for all vessels, military or commercial, then there could be recognition for giving states all this resource area for which they paid nothing. Uh, and that's a deal. It's in the convention if you read it. So we, uh, I'm going my fourth. I wanted to uh, talk about uh, the EEZ disputes. Uh, this is substantiating that there is a, uh, a huge amount of traffic in Malacca. Go to the nerd. next, please. Uh, the red stuff is where there are disputes. And the problem with disputes, uh, again, is uh, that uh, you are subject, uh, as Doug was talking about, to maybe several regimes. In the South China Sea, for example, we have well-known disputes between China and Vietnam, Philippines, Brunei, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia actually has a little one, although they don't admit it. Uh, anyway, uh, there are lots of disputes that exist there, and it is the gateway. I want to go to my next. Um, the South China Sea itself contains significant proved and probable oil and gas uh, reserves. There is not much going on because uh, the uh, risk adverse nature of, you know, if a lot of it is in waters that are disputed and if they're disputed, uh, you know, they, they uh, usually can't go ahead with development. But frankly, even more important than the whatever resources might be in the South China Sea are the uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, uh, about a third of the world's uh, natural gas, uh, liquefied, goes through the Straits of Malacca and into the South China Sea with the bulk of it uh, originating in the Persian Gulf. Uh, the LNG also flows into the region from Southeast Asia and Australia, Indonesia, and so on. Much of the LNG is bound for Japan and South Korea. The oil imports through the South China Sea and Malacca are uh, three times that that goes through the Suez and 15 times what goes through Panama. So uh, it is an important international waterway. And uh, right now, uh, South Korea gets about two thirds of its energy through that region. Uh, Japan gets 80% of its oil and gas. Taiwan's about 60%. China says it's getting 40%, but truthfully, it's getting a lot more than that. It's over 50 for sure. So the point you might note there is they have more interest in preserving freedom of navigation than we do. Why? Because they're zone locked. They can't get out of the mainland to the open ocean unless they go through somebody else's EEZ. So if they want to be nasty about the commercial activity and, or, or even try to do something about the military activity, although that's kind of useless because military vessels have sovereign immunity. So if they don't like a U.S. carrier task force and they're easy, they can't bomb it. They have to say to it, please get out of here just as fast and direct away as you can because they're dealing with the sovereign immunity of a vessel. And as they get to have a blue water Navy, that's going to become very important. Once all the generals that are there are re replaced with uh, 
20% of them admirals, and they realize that they're a global power, you're going to have a change in attitude. Not because, uh, you know, we, I'm, I'm a seer of any kind, but because their interests are changing. Even now, if they're getting 50% of their oil from the Persian Gulf, uh, and they're going through an area that has all kinds of disputes, that they're, they're certainly knowing that that is a bad thing. And so the countries that are having the problems there really have a lot of self-interest in working out something that is in everybody's interest. And by the way, it's all in the Law of the Sea Convention. That's what the 12 years of negotiation were all about. Those problems were confronted. It, they, were, they were satisfactorily resolved and that convention, uh, if it were followed, uh, would would be what would be the most stabilizing influence, and under rule of law. So why why aren't we uh, a party? Well, we can talk about that some more. Lastly, on my slides, most there's a lot of green up there. The ones that aren't are mostly from you know. Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, the, the former stands that were by and large landlocked that were in the Soviet bloc, and uh, Cambodia, which probably just can't get its act together, is a little purple thing there. But other than that, it's all green. And, and so it is very difficult for our State Department to go to the Chinese and say to them, uh, you know, you guys got to obey the law. And they say, you know, is it all customary law? Well, no, but all, all the stuff we like is. Uh, they, they, they have a tough time carrying the water when uh, they aren't adhering to the law themselves. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you, Myron. Let's uh, turn it over to uh, Ruth Widget. Well, there's little left to say after all these three marvelous uh, addresses, but let me add a, f a few things. W one is to cast shame on the historical British with their idea of Mary Closen. So some of the uh, blowback we're having from our attempt to champion freedom of navigation comes from our English forebears who thought that closed seas were just ducky. Uh, and uh, uh, I, I, I wish that episode had not occurred. Um, but I think for the moment, uh, clearly, freedom of navigation is ex essential to the world economy. Uh, if you're going to get garments from China or Sri Lanka or Malaysia to the market on time in North America, it can't just dawdle. It can't go by railroad. It has to go by, by fast-paced ships. Uh, and resupply, though could, also can be done in Mexico, oftentimes is done from Asia. So, in fact, uh, freedom of navigation and hassle-free navigation is something that really makes the velocity of exchange in the world economy all the faster and therefore all the mo more profitable. Um, in my little tenure at the, at, at the Naval War College, I got to play a few war games, and which was, were great fun, and I came away with extraordinary um, admiration for the fingerspitzgefühl sensitivity of um, mere soldiers and mere marines uh, to the intricate sensibility and politics of conflict areas. Uh, but clearly, we need the capacity to get around the globe very quickly. We have a small navy now, and we can say win, hold, win, but we got to get places very, very fast to make that a viable, a viable strategy. Um, so, when we're looking for a way to signal, as uh, was said many, many times before, there's nothing like the coy deployment of a carrier battle group, just to wave hello, not to do anything, not make any waves, but just to uh, remind people that the U.S. presence is real and that our interest is manifest by where we choose to go. So, from a military point of view, even though we're down a good number of carrier battle groups, uh, the free navigation and our willingness and budget uh, commitment, I hope, to deploying them is something that's the most effective form of signaling than, uh, that, we, that, that we could wish for. You can't fly where you can't sail, um, also. So basically, to, to maintain the, uh, except with permission, 
you can't overfly somebody else's uh, territory without their permission unless you are doing it on a maritime route. So again, our ability to get places, whether it's for civilian aircraft or military aircraft, is deeply parasitic to or dependent upon the freedom of navigation and the law of the sea convention. So this is really a, 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 a treaty on uh, uh, navigation both as much in the air as in the, uh, as in the sea. When we wanted to, it is alleged to bomb uh, Gaddafi in Libya. I don't think we, we could have maybe gone across France. Maybe we did, and it was all set to voce. But at a minimum, we could go down the Atlantic and go in, by the Straits of Gibraltar into the Med and then do what we had to do. So for the perception of the U.S. as being a significant military power that can react with measured um, uh, what's the right word, me me measured measures, but <laughs> a, 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 a proportionate measure. Uh, having the ability to go uh, sail, fly where we can sail is, is, is very, very helpful. Um, fisheries are a absolutely significant to a great part of the world. They don't get to buy Chuck E. Cheese hamburgers or order sirloin in the, in the uh, frozen food department of Giant. They really do depend upon fish, fish stocks and therefore for a great many poor countries uh, the uh, kind of uh, cultivation and, 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 and conservation of fish stocks through the Law of the Sea Convention is something that's essential for the ability of people to have the kind of calories they need to get educated and send their kids to school. Um, I do think that the perception that the Law of the Sea Convention was written in blood and therefore can never be changed is a bit exaggerated. It's true there's no process of amendment, but as any good English common lawyer knows, over time, if practice changes, understanding changes. So I don't, I think it's a misapprehension to suppose that this is a rigid um, treaty, framework treaty, that can never be adapted to changing circumstances. And um, uh, in, in that sense, I think when we moan and groan about how this would be would lock us in for all time we we do harm to ourselves that we need not have i mean the very fact of the boat paper the extraordinary who who could have supposed you could have done that boat paper where they, what they wanted to handle the um issue of deep sea bed mining and the treaty it's true says no reservations no reservations are permitted but um it was bunky moon right uh no it was, was it before bunky moon it was Paris to Quayar, excuse me. Anyway, the, the boat paper basically said that you can have a nunc pro tunc retrospective reinterpretation of the treaty uh, to allow uh, regulation of deep sea bed mining. And that innovation that in fact you can, even after the fact, um, uh, change a portion of a treaty instrument that seems too rigid is actually a very, I think, important procedural uh, innovation. And it was it was it was it was both Hernando de Soto, Alvaro de Soto, and Paris de Cuellar, a kind of Peruvian conspiracy, which made that possible and gave a kind of flexibility to treaty instruments that otherwise appeared to not permit reservations. Um, so I don't think that it's right to see this as a uh, kind of uh, stultifying calcium uh, uh, paralyzed framework. In fact, even treaty instruments that don't speak of amendments or reservations can, through usage, obtain a kind of suppleness that you need to adapt to changing circumstances. Um, my, I think most of us have spent about the last three years sitting through 5,010 South China Sea uh, seminars to no great effect other than to make the point that presence is crucial. And even if, South, even if the Chinese want to make the claim through archives they will not yet release that at some point in prehistoric time the South China Sea belonged only to them, nonetheless the U.S. presence and the ability of other countries to navigate freely is the uh, fly in their ointment and shows that uh, uh, de facto they can't maintain the, the absolutist position that they claim. I think it's unfortunate, again, that some of the Chinese mischief got as far as it did of, of building up reefs into airplane landing strips and uh, causing great harm to um, the delicate structure of uh, 
of uh, islands, but there's nobody, I think, except the Chinese and perhaps one or two other friends of theirs who would suppose that China has any basis for a claim of, uh, of ownership of the South China Sea. It is true there's a phrase about historic titles in the Law of the Sea Convention that gives me a little bit of pause uh, because no one knows quite where that might apply. But I don't think it's plausible in light of the practice of the last 40 years to suppose that that al allows you to, to declare any large body of water as Mary Clausen, as, as the Brits would have wanted to do under, uh, uh, under, under, under Selden. Um, what else? Um, I think we should spend more time worrying about the fate of landlocked states because they have a very hard time. It's a very, it's real curiosity that the very premise of the law of the sea convention is that oceanic access is crucial. And yet all the arrangements for landlocked states are ad hoc and don't seem to be uh, settled by any more principled and uniform regime. And you can do swap transactions and buy your way to uh, the benefits of having a railroad or a highway. But it does seem to me that uh, in the long run, landlocked states ought to be guaranteed of some kind of reasonable uh, access to the sea without having to beg for it. Um, there are, there are, of course, as we know, uh, controversies over what kind of surveillance you can uh, exercise of a mainland power, and the Chinese have maintained that it's an abuse of the idea of the exclusive economic zone to try to do surveillance from the sea to the land. And thus, we had the uh, the EP Prowler incident where a, a plane was uh, was was uh, forced down. But as far as I'm aware, that is pretty much an idiosyncratic Chinese point of view and has not yet to really uh, uh, hobbled us very much. And the kind of surveillance you can do from the coastline is very important to uh, have a readiness uh, to watch what your frenemies or your enemies or even your friends are doing in order to maintain a kind of forward-leaning force, force posture. Um, and then I will just mention one last thing from the Cold War and um, coming Cold War, if there should be another one, and what good craftsmanship can do. Uh, so the person, the craftsman will remain nameless, but he's a friend of all of ours. And this has to do with the coming importance of, of um, the Arctic, because it's a much shorter way to send a missile over the North Pole than it is to send it around the globe in the circumference. And as it turned out, a very wonderful man, who's all of our friends, is all, all of ours friend, uh, put in supple language in the Law of the Sea Convention that nobody noticed, which says that, yes, in an archipelago, the archipelagic state can determine how you pass through it, but that the, uh, the many variegated islands in the Canadian Northland are not an ar archipelago because they have a large mainland connected to them, which means, indeed, we do have a surveillance capability and I'm sure the Canadians will be our allies forever, but if not, if, if, not, if there's a friction with the regime, we still have the right, under the laws of the Sea Convention, if we follow it and endorse it, to have our <laughs> nuclear submarines and our surveillance uh, through underwater uh, methods uh, in the area that's closest to Russia uh, for, the, for the indefinite future. So if you, if it, the, the more paranoid you are about the Russians, the more you should endorse the law of the sea convention because you want to be able to watch them close up and uh, for long periods of time without being forced to move around all, all the time. So it, I, I, there, may, there may be some rule about succinctness and novels that people will read and one of the problems of the law of the sea convention is just too dang long and it's very hard to get people comfortable with the idea that they really understand its practical application when you have to study it, it really is a vocation, which is why, I, why I'm honored to be with my gentleman friends here, uh, to really ha have, a, have, a, have a deep sense of how it, its many parts uh, fit and play together. But it does give us crucial advantages uh, as a, uh, one of the last major states that's gonna have a significant international presence in trying to keep uh, global stability. And to that degree, I think, the more we, seem to feel embarrassed uh, by the idea of pledging something and not um, uh, living up to it, the, the, the more we need the treaty. One can, what, one can gain the suppleness that one may need in changing circumstances by interpretation. You don't have to stand outside and declare it all to be eyewash. 
and then to, then try to take advantage of what most countries have already signed up to. So the Paris de Cuellar example, the, the northern, the Canadian nor north example, uh, the, the book paper with Paris de Cuellar are, 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 I think, are lessons that even in a treaty without reservations permitted, uh, you can get the kind of uh, um, uh, bespoke tailoring that you might need to feel that you have protected your interests. So uh, why, the, why the, uh, the Senate doesn't like this stuff? Well, if you talk to the people in AL, they'll always tell you that the Senate never likes treaties, particularly. They don't like the treaty on the rights of disabled people. They're just, people are, you know, this is a big country. It's inward looking. We're suspicious of having our hands tied. We have global responsibilities and we don't have a, a sous chef or a personal lawyer to tell us every time we have a question as to how it would fit in a treaty regime. But, but I do think for something that's this architectonic, that there is a great advantage to the reputation of the U.S. and the 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 rebuff of any claim that we are a lawless superpower, which plenty of people want to argue on the, on the outside, to to signing up to a treaty, even if we take interpretations of some of the terms in a way that not all of our allies or certainly our enemies will agree with. Uh, this is a it's a um, nobody suggested that you should chuck out the. Oxford, the, the, the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Britannica or the Oxford English Dictionary just because you disagree with a couple of definitions because these are very large uh, regimes developed over time. You can't redo it. And a kind of, uh, of a reactive, reflexive, uh, just say no uh, posture will not win us either friends or allies, nor add to the efficacy of our own efforts to act alone. So. Uh, and bitch and moan about the treaty if you want to think part, act, claim that parts of it were badly drafted, have evolutionary uh, interpretations over time, where in fact customary law can affect the way the treaty language is read. But it, I think, is at this point is simply nonsense, kind of nonsense on stilts, to argue that you should chuck it out and start all over. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are right on time, and I'm going to open it up at this point for uh, Q and A from the audience. We have a, a mic. If you could identify yourself perhaps, and you might want to direct your question to uh, one or more members of the panel. So I'm Bob Kraft. First of all, thank you for a stimulating discussion. Uh, I come away from this um, thinking that it is a no brainer that uh, the United States should uh, be a member of UNCLOS. Um, can somebody, uh, you touched on this, uh, that Senate doesn't like treaties. Can somebody explain why we're not a member? Uh, Myron. There, there are two places to place the blame. One is in the White House, where there has been a succession of people full of verbiage about how wonderful the Law of the Sea Convention is, and then not doing a thing about making the deals that you have to make in order to get a treaty done. The second place is in the very length of it, because the Senate parliamentarian has said It'll take up at least a week of debate. And all you really need in the Senate is for four or five Congress senators who have heard from their constituents that the UN is involved in this some way. And you have a majority leader who then says, huh, are we doing okay without it being formalized here? And so as a practical matter, he says, I don't have a week to give to something that isn't real enough to take action on. So I think you can't blame this love in. You can't blame in all these industry people that have their interests improved by it. Uh, but you can blame our system of government. 
where you have no president that you can name that actually did anything to make the deal you have to make in order to get a treaty through. Nor can you find a majority leader, Republican or Democrat, that has said that he's willing to give the time to this issue in the Senate to get it done. And particularly when it has to do with the United Nations and you have people that just think if it's called the UN Treaty, it's got to be bad. If I could, I just seize the microphone to add one Philip to that. I have a wonderful poster at home, which I bring in to my class every year when we start our seminar on the UN and international security. It's a it's a very large poster of the various uh, flags of the United Nations and battleships, and the recollection that the phrase United Nations was used to describe the Allies in World War II. It's, it's, it's attribution to a, a treaty and to uh, the, the perhaps overly uh, uh, obscure uh, organization of, that's on First Avenue and, and uh, 44th Street. It's something, something quite else. The, the word United Nations has to do with the alliance of the uh, Western world against the fascists. And to that degree, the United Nations uh, here, too, could be seen really as a kind of celebratory um, title for what is taken to be a common interest, that everybody has an interest in free commerce, everybody has an interest in expeditious deployment of military assets to maintain stability. Uh, it is not some kind of either ladies' work of collecting on UNICEF, just for, which is terribly important, but perhaps not, not, not sufficient to stir the blood of the Senate. Uh, it really represents the commitment to common defense from 1945 onward. I think in the last go around, <clears throat> at least from those in the communication industry, there was a real sense of betrayal. Um, Senator Kennedy, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee didn't even put it to a vote. I mean, the hearings were excellent. I mean, you had the president of Verizon, you had I forget who the oil expert was. You had every general, uh, admiral. Couldn't have been better hearings. Could never have been set up as good. And a huge effort by then Secretary of State uh, Clinton to get it through. And everyone was told, you know, we're going to get it, a vote for the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He never even put it to a vote. And he had the votes to get it that far. He didn't do it. And then you talk to them and they say, you know what, we're never going to do this again unless the White House is really leading the charge, because we put a lot of effort into this. We were told that they were going to push it, and then they, they threw in the disability convention at the last minute for whatever reason. I don't know, but that was a complete blindside. So <clears throat> I think if the treaty is to be ratified, the White House has to take concrete steps, and it's got to be visible, and not one of these, well, we're thinking of doing, no, no president needs to put into it. And that's a, it's a big obstacle because the average American voter, I don't think really feels, what does this have to do with jobs or whatever? It's a tough issue to explain, but it really does take leadership both in the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, obviously the Senate Majority Leader, and they respond to whoever's in the White House and whether that's the priority for the president. Bob, as you can see, you've asked the critical question. And I do think uh, that uh, to get the treaty through, uh, absolutely will require clear presidential leadership. So if presidential leadership uh, emerges on this issue in the Trump administration, I believe that uh, this can go through the United States Senate. Um, I'm, I am continue to be very optimistic about that. I think there's one other element, though, that we ought to uh, talk about as well, and that is that much of the problem has been a, uh, uh, an ideologically driven, we might call it isolationist or we might call it nativist, um, distortion of the reality of the convention and what it is. And those are mailings and information that have been presented to the minority of senators that uh, had opposed, all of them on my side of the aisle, I might add, all in the Republican Party. I'm aware of no opposition in the Democratic side. 
And it's absolutely correct that Hillary Clinton uh, led uh, the effort to move it through the Senate more than any other high-level official uh, since the convention has gone there. And uh, I, too, was surprised that uh, we didn't move it. Uh, the reason I think it did not move at that time is uh, one of the hard right opponents who then shifted over to uh, running the program at the Heritage Foundation, the hard right opponents in the Senate at that point, uh, Senator DeMent, uh, to be frankly, frank on it, uh, ran around and got uh, junior Republicans to sign and got enough signatories that he had uh, uh, one third of the Senate signing, basically saying they opposed. But that was all in a setting in which there were no hearings and in which you were seeing a, uh, uh, a continuing um, uh, set of uh, completely false arguments about the convention, such as we are turning uh, the world's oceans over to the United Nations to govern it, such as um, the United States Navy will no longer be able to uh, uh, sail on the world's oceans without the permission of the United Nations, uh, such as uh, uh, all of our fishing uh, issues will be controlled by some other international organization. Um, these are, uh, I could, if, if you'd like, if anyone is interested uh, later, uh, go through about 25 of these that I've compiled. Uh, Tomorrow. <laughs> that are some of the... <laughs> some of the uh, principal uh, groups that were uh, arguing negatively against the treaty with their names and when they said it. Uh, these are not things that I'm uh, making, making up. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, uh, to, uh, to get it through, we really need to have that fundamental uh, debate. Uh, but part of it is also, I would say, the Democratic side of the aisle has made a mistake in thinking this was just an issue for the Republicans to uh, chew themselves up on. And uh, they, they didn't raise uh, uh, anything in terms of doing anything in the Senate. And they should have taken on the, uh, the, the, those in, the, uh, in my party, basically, that were uh, uh, espousing things that were completely inaccurate. So I think it's a, it's a uh, on the one hand, you need presidential leadership. Um, and I, I'm optimistic that at some point we will have that, and this convention will go through. Um, in fact, just two, two points that I would like to, to leave you with on this. The first of those is, rarely in a treaty do you get something that, that isn't trade-offs for the country. They're usually, well, here's a trade-off here, a lot of good things here, but here's a problem over here, a trade-off. This is virtually the only one I know in which there are no trade-offs. This is nothing but dramatic um, issues and wins supporting the United States Ocean's interest uh, and foreign policy interest, uh, with no downside on the other side, none whatsoever. Uh, the second of those that I think has already been mentioned, but. I think it makes it extremely important that we move this forward. This could never be renegotiated. The world has fundamentally changed. And this is the treaty that needs to be there to protect the common heritage of mankind. What we're really protecting in this is the common heritage. We are preventing individual nations from going out and just basically claiming the oceans willy-nilly with the loss of navigational freedom, the loss of cables, and all the rest. So this is enormously important for the United States. It's doable, and I'm hopeful the new administration will do it at an appropriate time. May I just add one correction? There was also a considerable amount of effort put in by John Nigger Ponte when he was the Deputy Secretary of State. And uh, so you at least have one good Republican. The other point is it was that- It's not in the Senate. 
there are lots of good Republicans strongly supporting this. Uh, and I, I'm uh, about to mention right. two of them. One is the existing Secretary of State, and the other is the existing Secretary of Defense, both of whom have supported this agreement. That's exactly right. And I don't know how much money I'll bet on leadership from the White House on this, but I think those two gentlemen may be the way we can get some and by the way, this adult is, attention. This is the first time we've ever had a Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State at the beginning of an administration both strongly supporting the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, is, this, is this on? Hi. I'm Rachel Carrillo. I'm with the United Nations Association of Boulder County in Colorado. And um, and I have a, a question relating to climate change and the Arctic Circle and the biodiversity um, that you brought up, Douglas, and then Ruth, you've talked about um, island states and China's, um, I think, uh, I can't remember the exact phrase you used. Mangling, I'll, I'll yeah, the basically, word mangling. yeah, the the, the the very delicate, you know, structures of of coral reefs and island states. Um, so, relating to climate change and the um, now postponed White House decision on whether or not to remain in the Paris Agreement or our our, um, uh, which I think was supposed to take place today. What, if any, are the impacts of climate change in the Arctic Circle and in the island states, and how does that affect um, U.S. national security, if at all, through climate events? I will boldly enter the silence, <laughs> which is that there actually are going to be places that are significantly low-lying low low island chains are going to be in some real hazard. And you might even, whether it's the Malacca's or elsewhere, have the problem of people forced to move because they have lost their you know, sufficient soil and territory to, to, to live upon. So you may, you may have some climate change um, exiles and some climate change refugees. Uh, there's probably not that much we can do about climate change other than try to limit pollution. Um, but it's the, the, the kind of uh, rootedness of peoples to land, which uh, was never true actually with migratory populations, but nonetheless if we have a fantasy it was, is going to be a, re a real debate. Uh, so. Uh, it's, it's rare that we think of ecological issues as being matters of foreign policy, but for, for countries that really are facing dilemmas like this, it, it, it will be that. You've asked a great question, and this is one actually that we present every year now to the students at the Rhodes Academy, um, which is the top training center in the world um, in ocean policy. Most of them, or many of them, go on to be to represent their country in the United Nations. And uh, it's, a, it's going to be a very real issue in which some islands <clears throat> will be submerged. Some already know that. Some are already uh, looking to create sovereign wealth funds, for example, to move their populations. Uh, so they're, they're very significant issues. Uh, but one very important thing from the environment is uh, the Law of the Sea Treaty created an environmental provision uh, that was viewed very favorably uh, uh, in Rio, uh, as this was the first time really uh, that uh, this has been done in the oceans. And the environmental groups, uh, like all of the industry groups, are strongly in support of moving forward in the treaty. Uh, I don't know many things in which the oil companies and the environmentalists are on the same side of the issue, but this happens to be one of them. You think I'd say the first cable laid in the Arctic began last summer. It'll be finished this summer. It covers uh, basically Eskimo villages in Alaska. 
Canada wants to do a similar one. Those cables ultimately are supposed to be connected to Japan and to Europe. So th that's the only way they can really get the internet effectively to some of those villages. And also in a commercial sense, it's a shorter route. So you have more latency. So for those that are interested in trading and communications, potentially it could provide a, a faster service, but there's a lot of problems with icebergs and different things. And I, I don't think any of us mentioned, but it goes without, without saying, the revolutionary effect of cables, or transmission of information by cable, uh, has on very poor countries, very poor people. Again, if you can get internet access and more telephone access came, uh, in, in East Africa and know what the price of cotton is on a daily basis or a, mm -hmm. a, a hourly basis, it changes your ability to negotiate a decent deal for yourself. So for very, very poor people, in fact, who don't care about watching television, although they might, might like to, but for just to, to pe people who are at subsistence and struggling to make a living and survive, uh, having up-to-date commodity information is absolutely crucial. And, and one of the great benefits, frankly, if you're rank ordering benefits of the convention, I don't know quite where it would be third, fifth, eighth, but it's, it's not trivial to have submarine cables that can let people be up to date and uh, enter fast moving markets in an intelligent way. Just have add, time they? for another two or three questions. Uh, Hi. We have two here. Yes. Uh, my name is Ron Salmond. Um, I'm with a Wix partner at the Wix Group here. I also am a contributor to uh, a magazine called The Diplomat covers uh, the Asia Pacific. Um, my question, well, first of all, you've, you've mentioned words like the United Nations, uh, technocratic committees, uh, delegation of authority. That's perhaps no surprise uh, when you say that the, the treaty couldn't be concluded today, that it might not get support today politically. And um, you know that's just an observation. Second observation is there's been 1,500 treaties ratified by the Senate, uh, but 1,800, 18,000, over 18,000 executive agreements uh, international executive agreement. So perhaps form and substance uh, matter uh, in this instance. But, uh, you know, other reasons perhaps why it might be an uphill battle uh, for uh, the treaty to be uh, ratified in the Senate. Uh, last year we had, of course, the South China Sea arbitration. One of the actions that the PCA took was, was not necessarily if you agree with the substance of the decision, but procedural jurisdictional uh, issue that it tackled. And that was whether to take the case at all. And uh, if you recall, China had declared that uh, delimitations of boundary disputes was not something that they wanted to be subject to permit to the arbitration process. And they tried to invoke that as a means not to, to not have the PCA take the case. The, the PCA ignored that and obviously the decision, they, they were very careful uh, in, in limiting their analysis, but, but in effect, their analysis would affect any type of boundaries based on the EEZs, et cetera. So uh, China, of course, has ignored that decision. We were, if we move back 15 years ago uh, to, to the Rome Statute in the ICC, there was fear here in the United States uh, that uh, there would be a court that would invoke jurisdiction and we wouldn't have the ability to challenge that jurisdiction. Of course, we saw that last year now with China in the South China Sea. So uh, I, I can imagine that uh, some, some of the arguments could be thrown out. China even thought about withdrawing. There was a, there was a you know, they, 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 they threaten to do so. I think, you, as you said, their interests probably indicate that they don't need to do so and they probably shouldn't have to do so. But there was a threat that China was going to pull out. Um, so maybe you can address this idea of maybe how, how the PCA's decision, South China Sea arbitration, either hurts or helps uh, the United States uh, in its effort to get it ratified. And, and you've already talked about some of those head, the other headwinds, but that one procedural aspect I'd, I'd like to see your comments on. Thank you. I'd like to start with that, Myron, and then I'm going to turn it over to you. And, and Ruth and anyone else that would like to uh, talk about it. But a couple of other points that you've made, however, uh, this is not going to be put through as an executive agreement. Uh, there's been a, uh, I was one of those that made the commitment to the United States Senate uh, that this would be presented as a treaty. Uh, that's the way it will go. You're quite right. Uh, many executive agreements, particularly those that are executive congressional agreements or others that go through both houses of Congress, that is another alternate route, uh, legally under the U.S. Constitution. Uh, that will not happen here because there have been a series of, I think, appropriate um, indications to the Senate that this will only go to the Senate as, as a treaty, and I think it will be approved as, as a treaty. 
Um, the um, South China Sea arbitration, uh, in terms of uh, what happened, and then secondly, what is the U.S. risk uh, on sort of out of control uh, uh, judicial proceedings? Um, I do not interpret the South China Sea arbitration as something that uh, violated the jurisdictional provisions of the treaty. There are differences uh, among scholars about that. Uh, the um, the Chinese certainly have that that view. Um, I think my colleague Myron Norquist may have that, that view. view. Uh, I do not. Uh, I believe the core issue here that was at stake was an illegal nine dash line claim made by China, basically claiming the entire South China Sea. Uh, that there was not something that was involved in any of the three articles mentioned specifically on boundary issues. Uh, that basically were excluded from jurisdiction under the convention uh, should the parties have accepted the exclusion as China uh, had. So in this case, what you were really talking about is, an, is uh, in my judgment, an absolutely outrageous claim that had no basis in the rule of law uh, anywhere that was courageously taken by the court. By the way, the likely the one that uh, wrote that opinion was a graduate of the University of Virginia School of Law Oceans program, one of my former students, who uh, ended up, by the way, as president of the uh, uh, Law of the Sea Tribunal uh, and did a brilliant job at it. Rudiger Wolfram was an ambassador in Germany, et cetera. It took a lot of courage to do it, uh, but the core of this was not uh, something dealing with uh, boundary delimitations. It was uh, dealing with uh, uh, making it very clear there was no legal basis for the nine-dash line, uh, something that was enormously in the interest of the United States and the entire international community, and I believe in the long run in China itself. Uh, now, Myron will, will, I suspect, have a somewhat different take on that. Uh, go for it, Myron. <laughs> you don't know what the nine-dash line is because the Chinese have never said what it is. Because they don't know what it is. They are being very intelligent by saying it is going to be kept deliberately ambiguous. It serves their interest to keep it that way. The opinion I have is that this decision is an overreach by the arbitration tribunal that was so desperate to get the jurisdiction that they said there was no overlapping jurisdiction, which would, under Article 298.1, which the Chinese had registered their uh, uh, opt-out of compulsory jurisdiction, would have meant they would have no jurisdiction. I mean, these guys are very good friends of mine. I'm not mad at them. I've been married 54 years, and I lose arguments there every day. <laughs> But the point I'm really concerned about is not He's mansplaining two, here. <laughs> is not 2981, which has to do with disputed. But if they can if they can reach out and ignore disputes, even if it was a rock and they had 12 mile jurisdictions, they would still have overlapping jurisdictions, which would take the case out. So I think it was a convenience to them in order to uh, pretend that there was no overlap. And what the danger is for us in this country is that, well, I don't care about the fact that I think it's very unfair that Johnston Island can, you know, a little spot can claim 200 mile EEZs and that's all okay. But what I worry about is 298.2 which says that if we ever become a party, believe me, we're going to say, because we fought like the devil for it, there is no compulsory jurisdiction over military operations. And if this court or arbitration, it really wasn't the PCA. It was an arbitration panel under it loss that was the registrar was a PCA, permanent court of arbitration. So people say it was a PCA, and I know you probably know better, but the point is that it was really done under the auspices of the ITLOS. 
Uh, and if an arbitration panel of five Europeans can say that they're going to ignore the jurisdictions and take the case in two under 298, one being irrelevant, they can do the same thing under 298. Now, let me tell you why Myron is wrong. <laughs> She, she's trying to cut you off. Will, will this marriage last? I don't know. The, um, the reason Myron is wrong <laughs> is that Article 298A1 uh, deals with, uh, and this is the jurisdictional question at issue uh, here, deals with uh, boundary delimitations identified by three articles, as well as the notion historic bays or titles. China has never said the nine dash line is an historic bay or title. They will try that later. But they have not. And secondly, uh, there is never in the law of the sea, ever any notion of historic bays or titles to actually claim oceans themselves. Mm -hmm. That would be an outrageous interpretation uh, of it. So uh, I think Myron is wrong. But there's an even more important reason about what hope about, <laughs> about the about the jurisdictional issue. I do not believe they exceeded their jurisdiction. But the second the second point here, which is the one you're getting at, is in the United States at risk. And Myron is asking this on the military issue. Yeah. The answer is the text of the resolution of advice and consent to ratification that's been sitting before the Senate for many years deals explicitly with this issue. It says the United States declares that its consent to accession to the convention is conditioned upon the understanding that under Article 288.1b, that's the military one Myron mentioned, each state party has the exclusive right to determine whether its activities are or were, quote, military activities and that such determinations are not subject to review. That's a Chinese position on one. Could, could I just say one more thing, uh, and Madame, just give me one moment, um, which is, I mean, I, personally, aesthetically, pragmatically, I think it's probably a mistake in general to put forward treaty instruments that don't permit reservations, because reservations are actually very useful. They can catch things that weren't, done in the treaty conference, I mean, watching the Rome co conference on the ICC, uh, kind of shuck and jive after it was finished in a grand finale on, with, with no sleep and nobody actually had read it through because they were combining different working groups and trying to make it work uh, in, in, in a hell bent for leather five week period. Uh, mistakes happen in treaty negotiations, even ones that are more leisurely, and therefore one should be, I think, somewhat open-minded about the one's the prerogative with consensus to adapt treaty language that might admit of different interpretations, ha have an evolution of text, if you will, an under evolution of understanding of text. But at the same time, if you're gonna have a, have a systematic, uh, kind of like Justinian's code, but without the shutting of the door, if you're gonna have a very large regime, which will pose lots of intricate questions, then you do have to have a kind of a willingness to uh, uh, find uh, accommodations if something's not working quite as the original drafters of the language had hoped that it would. And it may be unwise to not permit uh, reservations, uh, but there are lots of ways to skin a cat. You're not making a reservation, you're just reinterpreting. You know, again, I, I can't resist this uh, with my <laughs> good colleague, uh, Ruth Wedgwood. Uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, intellectual uh, uh, question about treaties generally, and I think there are many treaties that uh, uh, Ruth's absolutely correct. Uh, she is not correct about the Law of the Sea Treaty. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I probably knew that coming in, right? This, this, <laughs> This is an issue. This is an issue in which the uh, NSC Interagency Task Force on Law of the Sea, of 18 different agencies in the U.S. government, examined it at an, with enormous care. And if you had reservations, there would have been nothing that would have worked here at all. Uh, every single straight state out there 
that did not want to grant navigational freedom through the strait would have put on a reservation. Every state in the world that wanted to limit navigational freedom in one way or another would have put on a reservation. The remarkable thing about this, and one of the reasons why it couldn't be renegotiated again uh, today, is this was a package deal, an incredible package deal, and it is in the common interest as well as that of the United States of America. I think that is an excellent question. We have time for one final question, and there's a reception awaiting for you. Yes, hi, uh, Ruth. Um, you're actually, the statement you made about reservations, I was wondering if it sort of somewhat answered my question in, in an indirect way, but the question I had was, in terms of the subject matter that was is at stake today, how do you reconcile this question because you have important to US industry and national security? And I had a question about how do you reconcile the national security issue versus the um, sovereignty issue of you know that we're facing right now in the US? Because I, I'm very pleased that it seems like the panelists are optimistic. But at the same time, more you mentioned that we're now in an isolationist nationalist mood. Given the exigencies of that, I'm very pleased with your optimist, optimism because you know that it was during the Clinton administration that, the, that he signed the addendum to the UNCLOS, right? And the, 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 the navigational aspects are not as controversial as the mining part, uh, sections of this question. Now, my question is how do you reconcile the national security interests as the state sovereignty? Because it's not a new thing in the US, right? Somebody, the lady mentioned climate change, but there's also the ICC. The U.S. is always reluctant to, you know, uh, to uh, accede to, you know, other interventions from external forces. And linked to that too is the. Um, I understand at least from the latest, unless correct me if that's wrong, but the U.S. also had recommended in the past, not just during this administration, which you know that hasn't arisen yet. Um, the right to have veto power over the ISA, the International Seabed Authority, right? Is Do you ever envisage that that will ever happen, that other nations would allow the U.S. to have veto power over decisions of the ISA? And that's tied in with the state sovereignty issue, which is what we're always grappling with in the U.S. in terms of, you know, ratifying these conventions. I'm going to first uh, see if there's an opportunity for anybody else to respond, and then I will respond to both of those points very briefly. Let, let, let me just make a, 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 com a, a fr friendly but uh, bemused comment about the, the International Criminal Court and how it was negotiated. I do think it's a mistake to negotiate things in at, at max speed. So when the, when, the, when the Canadians and others set a five-week limit for negotiation of a very complicated criminal law treaty, that was a mistake. I think it was probably a mistake to bite off more than you can chew. And a friend of mine was, a very lovely friend of mine was assigned to meet with heads of state uh, to try to induce them to sign the uh, Rome Statute. Um, and I'm given to believe by general hearsay that many heads of state were not apprised that they themselves might be vulnerable to arrest under the ICC. It's probably better to have told them and told them that we know they're such good guys, it would never affect them. But a good number of African states were surprised when their heads were in the noose. It was surely a mistake to have a uh, initial agenda of only indicting African heads of state or African, dealing with African countries. So I, I, at times I do think there can be a kind of um, puritanism about treaties that keeps people from exercising the subtleness and the suppleness of the French. A little wine, a little fairy dust, and a little reticence uh, can get you much farther than a kind of a, uh, 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 just a devil may care uh, rigidity about how you begin to stand up and stabilize treaty regimes. And politics matters, and lawyers can't go into this without paying attention to it, setting five-week limits on treaty conferences is not a good idea. Having reconciliation of texts at two o'clock in the morning on the last day is not a good idea. One should take language caref seriously and carefully. So I think we're often rather clumsy in how we allow treaty conferences to proceed. But that being said, um, 
you will gonna, you're gonna often have deliberate ambiguity because countries can't agree and rather than divorce immediately, they figure they can kick the can down the road and by then the kids are grown and nobody will care. <laughs> I'm not optimistic. Okay, a couple of things. Uh, one, I very much agree with uh, Ruth on the question of the uh, uh, don't don't rush treaties. Uh, you know, when we did that, it was UNCLOS 1 and 2, 1958 and 1960. We lost one vote, people went home. Uh, it was some 25 years later that we actually came to the law of the sea. But I'm happy to say, Ruth, that this one was not done quickly. Myron said 12 years. When you look at the renegotiation possible for deep sea bed mining, it was 25 years. This was a quarter of a century uh, at the highest levels, by the way, not done by uh, a group of lawyers in a room. This went to uh, heads of state uh, literally all over the world at the highest level. A remarkable uh, achievement in multilateral negotiation. On the question of sovereignty as to why that should be a problem, that is exactly one of the arguments made against the treaty. The problem with it is there is not a single ounce of United States sovereignty that is removed by this treaty. And there's massive increases in United States sovereign rights and uh, rights over resources out to 200 nautical miles, as well as actually <coughs> sovereignty in areas of the extension of the territorial sea. Uh, and the uh, protection of the uh, sovereign rights of uh, and sovereign immunity of U.S. warships. So in reality, there's not, there's literally, I have challenged the opponents, show me a, give me a single ounce of sovereignty lost in this treaty. And I will also, and there aren't any, and I will show you on the other side, pounds and pounds of sovereignty gains for the United States. As to the question of the veto in the International Seabed Authority, uh, it's not that the United States is the only one that has that veto. Uh, the critical issues to be made by the International Seabed Authority are things in which members of the Council uh, have the ability to, to veto. Uh, and there, there's, a, there's a group of states that are on the Council that have the ability individually to veto because it requires consensus among the members. <coughs> What's unique for the United States in that Council is we're the only permanent member uh, of that council. The others can be rotated off. And so it actually is an extraordinary international precedent uh, for the United States of America in that. We asked the uh, question in the title of this program, UNCLOS, is it in the U.S.'s economic interest and national interest? I think we got a overwhelmingly firm affirmative answer to that question from this group today. Uh, I thank all of you for a very stimulating program and invite you all to join us afterwards with the participants. Thank you. Thank you.